Puff Bar was once the most popular vape in the world, but after evading federal laws, marketing their vapes to teens, and much more, the brand has essentially gone extinct. From making $3 million a week to being banned by the government, the rise and fall of Puff Bar is one of the most interesting stories I've ever seen. But what exactly is that story? How did they go from such a high to such a low? Well, it's best to start with how they got to that high, which happened rather quickly. When Puff Bar entered the US market in 2019, sales were slow, thanks to Juul dominating the landscape. The disposable brand reached a measly 14,000 in revenue in the last three months of 2019, but it didn't stay like that for long. When the FDA laid the hammer down on Juul and got rid of their fruity pod flavors, their customers, which were a lot of children, were looking for alternatives, and they found Puff Bar, which was a disposable vape that hadn't had their flavors banned. This tidal wave of new consumers skyrocketed Puff Bar's revenue to 3.3 million in January 2020 alone, and eventually, they were making that a week through April. However, while Puff Bar was starting to show up in every bar, fraternity, and high school bathroom, parents were getting worried. And it wasn't just the parents. Everyone from lawmakers to anti-vaping groups couldn't help but notice the brand's huge popularity among the youth. One of the more prominent voices against Puff Bar was Representative Raja Krishnamurti, who spoke out against the brand seemingly nonstop. When I go to their website and I see strawberry banana and raspberry ice and banana ice flavors being sold, I know exactly who they're appealing to. It's mainly kids. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking that his argument is straight junk because adults like flavors too. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot of merit to that argument, but Raja's point of view has some merit too. Take a look at one of Puff Bar's ads released during the pandemic. We know that the inside vibes have been quite a challenge. Stay sane with Puff Bar this solo break. We know you'll love it. It's the perfect escape from the back-to-back -back Zoom calls, parental texts, and work-from-home stress. This, objectively, is targeted at teens, and there were more ads like it, featuring models blowing fat clouds and suggesting that Puff Bar was a great way to relax over spring break. These ads are what eventually ignited Raja to ask the FDA to ban Puff Bar in late May 2020. But there was a problem with this request. No one knew who actually owned Puff Bar. The brand that was selling over 300,000 vapes a week had never publicly stated who was behind the brand, not even on its own website. The mysterious nature of Puff Bar was an issue for the FDA, because without someone in charge, they couldn't put any blame on anyone. Further digging into the company did reveal some stuff, but it only led to more questions. For example, Puff Bar had two mailing addresses, one at a closed down storefront in Skid Row and another at a random P.O. box in California. So so did they even have a headquarters? There was also a company that kept coming up in my research, Cool Clouds Distribution. The founder, Ume Abu Bakr, claimed that they used to own Puff Bar, but eventually sold it to someone, someone they refused to name. Cool Clouds was also connected to DS Vaping, a vape manufacturer based in Shenzhen, China, that had a license to make Puff Bar branded products. But they never claimed to be the owners either. The whole owner situation felt like one big cat and mouse game that was going nowhere. But in July of 2020, that all changed. It was then that the FDA finally discovered who was behind the brand and sent them an official warning letter to stop selling their products. The letter detailed how Puff Bar never received FDA approval to sell their stuff, which was required for all vaping products on the market. The brand had 15 days to either stop selling their products or submit a request for approval. And if they didn't comply, they would be faced with massive fines. But who would have to pay for those fines? In other words, who who were the owners of Puff Bar? Ladies and gentlemen, meet Patrick Beltman and Nick Manass, two 27-year-olds from Los Angeles, California. After months of digging into the company, the FDA finally found these two to be the sole owners of Puff Bar, and it turned out the duo had quite the history. Patrick and Nick had been friends since childhood, and first got their start in the vaping industry with their website eliquidshop.com, a company they started while attending community college. They were later hired to run Puff Bar's website, and eventually took over the company in mid-2020, around the same time the FDA sent their letter. And after they took over, Nick and Patrick made a shit ton of money and it seemed like they were spending it wisely. Legal documents revealed that the duo bought a $1.7 million mansion in Los Angeles, and all over their social media, Patrick and Nick can be seen flexing multiple Lamborghinis, Mercedes, and many, many, many more cars. So these were the guys. They had full ownership in Puff Bar and were clearly doing well for themselves. But now, with the FDA forcing them to stop selling their vapes, what were they gonna do? Could they leave the fast life behind and comply with the government? Well, shockingly, 
The answer is yes. On July 13th, 2020, Puff Bar removed all of their products off their website and stopped selling to distributors. This move obviously affected their sales, bringing Puff Bar down from being the number one highest selling disposable to number three. However, this didn't seem to stop the duo. If anything, it motivated them going into 2021 and forced them to come up with a plan a plan that was admittedly genius. They deemed 2021 to be the year of transparency. What that meant was going on a massive press run and attempting to clear up the mysterious nature of Puff Bar. We're aware that there is a lot of mystery and there was a lot of shadowiness before. Us being here right now talking with you guys is uh, our first step in kind of really like building the trust with our consumers. They sat down with multiple news organizations with lawyers off camera and were more than happy to answer any questions they had about the company. But these orgs soon realized that something sketchy was up. It turned out there was a lot Nick and Patrick couldn't talk about, like who the previous owners were or who hired them. The original co-founding partner decided that they didn't want to continue the brand in the direction that we saw most fit. Um, and that's where we kind of came into full and control. When did that meeting happen? Um, I would say like late to mid 2020. And who were these prior partners? Can you say? No, we, oh, we, yeah. we can't say. How much money did it cost to buy the trademark and the business that is Puff Bar. That's kind of actually, yeah, yeah, that's part of our NDA, unfortunately. What they were able to talk about is where Puff Bar came from. So it was a Chinese manufacturer that had kind of put this brand package together. The brand was set up by a Chinese company? I didn't know that. I would say like the, the brand was founded with the collaboration of US personnel kind of mm -hmm. like giving the input. The issue of underage vaping came up as well, and the duo claimed it wasn't their fault. Nick and Patrick agree it's a problem. I, I think it's I think it's horrible. I guess I'm sorry to hear that. But not necessarily their problem. I think the government seemed to do a better job on going after retailers and the distribution channels that are actually pushing these products out there. So these interviews didn't clear up much. We know Puff Bar came from a Chinese company, but nothing much else. However, all of that wouldn't matter because in March 2021, a new problem arose. Puff Bar was back. Just nine months after they pulled their products off shelves, Puff Bar put them back on. But how could they do this? They were banned from selling their vapes, right? Well, not anymore, thanks to a sneaky legal loophole. To explain in simple terms, the FDA has authority to regulate tobacco-derived nicotine products, which includes brands like Juul and Puff Bar. But what Nick and Patrick realized is that if they simply switched their nicotine juice formula, the FDA wouldn't have any authority over them. And that's exactly what they did. The duo produced a new formula formula of juice that contained synthetically derived nicotine, which was just a bunch of chemicals, but crucially didn't contain any nicotine derived from a tobacco plant. This, technically speaking, meant that Puff Bar was now not considered a tobacco derived nicotine product, and therefore didn't have to abide by the FDA's rules. This, obviously, was a very suspect move from Nick and Patrick, making them look like they were trying to evade the FDA. But according to them, they did it for a different reason. They tried explaining how they switched the formula simply for a better user experience and nothing else. These loopholes have caused us to look for alternative ways to, to still continue to provide our, cus our consumers and customers with the products that they need. We see more enjoyment with um, our product now. However, the opposing side saw right through their bullshit. Bunk. Total bunk. That's not why they're doing it. The FDA has just been slow and tentative, and now they're getting punked by two 27-year-olds. Would you call this a loophole that companies are rushing through to stay on the market? It is an Oklahoma land rush going through a very wide loophole. I will make sure that it's crystal clear in the law that they should and can regulate in this area. Raja was talking about the FDA and how he was planning on creating a new law that would allow them to regulate synthetic nicotine products. But unfortunately for him, the FDA had other plans. They wanted to regulate synthetic nicotine companies on a case-by-case -case basis and proceed with caution on what to do with companies like Puff Bar. To put it another way, Nick and Patrick got off scot-free and were now back in business selling Puff Bars. And they sold a lot of them in 2021. The brand shot back up is the top selling disposable vape, doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. And parallel to their financial success, Puff Bar was also finding a lot of success on TikTok and just social media in general, where millions of teens were starting to form a culture around the brand. Videos of skits, stories, product reviews, and I guess showing off were garnering hundreds of millions of views. It seemed like the hype behind Puff Bar was never going to stop, and the duo behind the brand were going to reap the benefits for years to come. But alas, after a a year of planning, the FDA was finally ready 
to lay the hammer down. In March 2022, the Consolidated Appropriations Act was passed, a law that allowed the FDA to regulate synthetic nicotine. This meant that all companies who use synthetic, including Puff Bar, were now back under regulation of the FDA, and the organization wasted no time with their newfound authority. Nick and Patrick were sent another warning from the FDA, detailing once again that they had 15 days to submit a request for approval or stop selling their products. The only difference this time around was that this letter seemed to do the trick. The the duo no longer sells nicotine vapes, at least in the US, and have since pivoted to selling Zero Nick and Delta 8 products. And nowadays, teens aren't using puff bars anymore, so problem solved. But there's still a gazillion fruity disposables on the market, and they're in every gas station everywhere. So did the FDA do something good here? I, I don't know. 